You already saw the startup animation, but it's just so darn iconic. And let's be honest, you wanted to see it again anyway, so uh, you're welcome for that. You can just leave a nice little uh, like for my services. You're welcome, yeah. The startup music has three different sounds as well. There's the regular one, which we're all familiar with. But then if you hold Z with one controller, you get a bunch of Animal Crossing sound effects instead. <laughs> hold Z with four controllers, and you get this really fancy Chinese sounding version. <laughs> Name another console that does stuff like this. I dare you. Just look at that beauty. The GameCube is a console design that manages to be sleek, cute, and hot all at the same time. How does it do that? I don't know. And the discs are adorable. Look how small they are. It was Nintendo's answer to piracy, which uh, <laughs> it didn't work out too well in the end, but history has left us with a truly unique looking disc. Remember when GameCube memes were a thing? Those are still some of the best memes the internet has produced. The menu music is so calming yet terrifying at the same time. It has such an early 2000s aura to it. The GameCube controller. It looks like a hot mess, but then you actually use it and it's just hot. The joystick is so crisp and flawless. The buttons have a great clickiness to them and are placed in a way that wraps well with your thumbs. R and L have analog triggers. There's built-in rumble without having to install a rumble pack. What's not to love? Oh, mmm. This controller is so good that Nintendo made an adapter for the Wii you and the Switch so you could still use it for Smash Bros. You know you got a winner when the controller is actively encouraged to be used 20 years later. The WaveBird wireless controller worked by connecting with a radio sensor, and it functioned just about the same as a wired one. Memory cards might be outdated today, but they still have this really cool and fun look to them. I only have a couple, but they came in a bunch of different styles and sizes. And those little icons with your save files are super charming. Seeing your save data in this way feels so much more personalized for some reason. I only just realized that the Mario Golf Toadstool Tour icon is just Mario's face on a golf ball. That is so goofy, I love it. The GameCube has a calendar and is also able to keep track of time. Back in the day, this was a neat feature. You can connect your Game Boy Advance with a link cable to do a whole assortment of things. Some games let you play multiplayer, others have you unlock stuff, or it can even be used for general storage and transfers. The GameCube DDR pad is not only a really solid gamepad, but it's got a breakdancing Mario silhouette. I mean, does it really get better than that? Also, just the fact that a Mario DDR game exists, and Waluigi is the bad guy, that's amazing! The microphone might look like a child's toy, but uh, that's because it is and it works pretty well for Mario Party 6 and 7. Don't even get me started on that Game Boy player. The ability to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games was genuinely mind-blowing, pun not intended. As a kid, I spent almost all my allowance on a Game Boy player, and it was 100% worth it. While the GameCube didn't have online built in, there was a broadband adapter you could get to play a few games via a local network. Some say the 90s were the wackiest when it came to game controllers, but just look at these DK bongos. They're used for the Donkey Konga series and Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, but yeah, you just play the whole game slapping your sausages to the music. Like, come on, that's pretty sick. Then you've got this ridiculous ASCII controller which has a fully functional built-in keyboard. This is unironically the controller I use when casually playing GameCube games. It's surprisingly comfortable. I love that Mario Kart Double Dash has an entire battle stage dedicated to the GameCube. It's so stupidly chaotic and I can't get enough. And the GameCube version of Monkey Ball 2 had a stage called GameCube, where you had to get inside the GameCube to reach the goal. This is a cube with pizzazz. So the Panasonic Q is an incredible piece of technology. It's a DVD player and GameCube at the same time. It is just beautiful looking. It's really too bad that it only sold in Japan and it was expensive at the time. Let's just be straight here. The best version of Soul Calibur 2 is the GameCube one because Link is playable. Doi, you don't agree with me? Your opinion is wrong. Got him. This was also the era where Mario, Luigi, and Peach were showing up in random sports games. They were playable in NBA Street V3 as well as SSX on tour. Why? I have no idea, but I love how ridiculous they look in comparison to those respective games. I miss stuff like this. It's that time in the video where I need to gush about the GameCube's insanely great library of games and why buying them in 2021 has gotten so expensive. Super Smash Bros. Melee, one of the best sequels to a video game of all time. More characters, more stages, more items, more game modes, more fun, more of what you wanted out of Smash Bros. This game is so damn good that it spawned the It's Not Melee joke for years on this channel. 
Luigi's Mansion was originally considered more of a tech demo for the GameCube controller, but the game itself has aged surprisingly well and takes the concept of sucking up ghosts in a haunted mansion to the next level. Super Mario Sunshine is an amazing game. I know the blue coins kind of suck and so does the pachinko machine level, but who cares when Delfino Plaza has a goddamn vibe and all the other levels take the beach theme and expand upon it in a multitude of creative ways. F-Zero GX is one of the best racing games Nintendo has ever owned. The visuals have aged very well. The cutscenes are hilarious corny, and it's simply a badass, fluid, futuristic racer. Why hasn't there been a proper F-Zero in almost 20 years? Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is by far one of the best Paper Mario games in the series, and that's coming from someone that enjoyed Color Splash and Origami King. The gameplay is fun, the story is interesting, the themes are really varied, and the characters are so memorable. Mario Kart Double Dash, the Nintendo game where they're just like, yeah, I'll, I don't know, two racers on a cart, have them swap places, psh, whatever, no big deal. While 16 tracks isn't a lot, you can't deny the sheer creativity and innovations this Mario Kart went for, and the music is incredibly unforgettable. The Mario sports games were at their peak in this generation. Super Mario Strikers, Mario Power Tennis, Mario Superstar Baseball, Mario Golf Toadstool Tour, all of these titles were filled to the brim with game modes, interesting characters, and pure joy. I'll play these any day compared to a modern Mario sports game. Like, seriously, if you haven't played them, you have no idea what you're missing. And Wario was absolutely slaying on this console, too. You got WarioWare Mega Party Games, which was the beginning of the WarioWare franchise, and then there's Wario World, a 3D platformer dedicated to the thick man himself. These games weren't super great, but goddamn, Nintendo was on the ball with using their IP. Every generation has Sonic re-releases, but the most definitive versions were Sonic Mega Collection and Sonic Gems Collection. Sonic Mega Collection is packed to the brim with extra content like comic covers, special illustrations of Sonic, and promo videos of other Sonic games. The game selection felt complete too with Sonic the Hedgehog 1 through 3, Sonic 3D Blast, Sonic Spinball, and the list goes on and on. Sonic Gems Collection filled in the tiny gaps left with Sonic CD, Sonic R, Sonic the Fighters, some of the Game Gear library, and even Vectorman 1 and 2. Too, which are sleeper hits. Zelda was also banging on the GameCube, with The Wind Waker being one of the most aesthetically nice looking Zelda games to this date. It held up so well that Nintendo made an HD re-release on the Wii U, and probably the Switch at this point if it hasn't already happened for those watching in the future. Then there's Four Swords Adventures, which allows you to play Zelda with four different people. There's even ports of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, and of course Twilight Princess. Pikmin first released on the GameCube, and both of the games are still some of Nintendo's most underrated IP. I've never been into the RTS games, but this is one of the few that I really enjoy playing. Monkey Ball 1 and 2 on Nintendo GameCube. Yep, that's it. That's all I gotta say. While we didn't get a proper Kirby game, we did get Kirby Air Ride, which, uh, you know, frankly is like the next best thing, if not better than most Kirby games. A lot of the GameCube Mario parties were similar, but that didn't matter because all of them had fun boards, mini games, and great times packed within. I haven't played Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, but I've heard it's one of the best Fire Emblem games to this date, and it's a rare one too. Thanks to Smash Bros, this series started to pick up popularity in the West. Nobody thought Metroid could work in 3D, but then Metroid Prime 1 and 2 happened, and now all people want are new Metroid Prime games. We got some truly unique Pokemon games on the GameCube. These include Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. The objective is to purify shadow Pokemon, and you'll snag Pokemon from other trainers instead of catching them randomly. The GameCube had the very first Animal Crossing, which has now spawned into one of Nintendo's biggest IPs of all time. To be honest, I could just keep on going here, but I'll end things with Chibi Robo, the game where you play as a tiny robot doing chores around the house. One of the neatest ideas out there, and we somehow don't have Chibi Robo games coming out currently. 